Hi, thank you for having me to talk. Um, so today I'm doing uh, clinical pathological pace rounds on positive surgical margins and focusing on uh, their treatment. Um, I'm going to be talking about... Move forward. A couple cases. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on... Uh, three cases here of different types of positive margins, particularly ones that are a little bit more uh, difficult uh, to manage treatment for. Um, the less sort of straightforward ones that have a little more controversy to them. And we'll be talking about uh, the pathology. Dr. Skinner is here to talk about uh, the pathology for these, and Dr. Tilsley uh, will be here to discuss uh, the radiation oncology side of things uh, from their perspective for management of these patients. And I encourage any discussion uh, throughout. We um, do have quite a lot to get through um, and a short period of time, so we'll do what I do best and jump right in um, and start talking about positive surgical margins. Um, so what is a positive surgical margin? Uh, it's when tumor cells reach the inked uh, border on a prostatectomy specimen. Um, these are thought to occur in between about 10 to 36 percent of uh, prostatectomy <coughs> specimens, depending on uh, the paper you read. Um, and they're traditionally felt a compromised cure. However, there is quite a variety of, um, of theories on uh, the prognostic significance of positive, positive surgical margins um, and uh, their risk of biochemical recurrence as well as local recurrence if they do occur. Now, this is just a uh, summary slide of a number of different papers which show that there isn't complete agreement on the impact of positive, positive surgical margins. As you can see here, more recent papers have shown that it's an independent predictor of recurrence. However, there are a number of studies that have shown uh, it not to be an independent predictor. So why is there disagreement on the value of a positive surgical margin? Um, there's a number of different explanations for this. Uh, one is that perhaps these tumor cells uh, are damaged during surgery and they might be left behind, but they're, uh, they don't grow after, uh, after they're left behind. Another reason is that Perhaps these uh, cancer cells are left behind or damaged and repaired during the reparative process and do not become significant. Um, another thought is that the microenvironment created by the tumor itself, once that is gone, uh, does not support these residual uh, tumor cells and therefore uh, they do not become significant. Some feel that perhaps this margin is the last layer and it doesn't extend beyond that. Um, that's another theory as to why they may not be significant. Um, Another point is that a lot of these studies are a bit shorter and perhaps the margins are significant, but we don't follow them out long enough to show a biochemical recurrence. Uh, and lastly, a number of the studies are based on more high-risk patients, and perhaps in these high-risk patients, positive surgical margins uh, aren't an independent factor because they're outweighed uh, by the high-risk uh, nature of the disease. So in case things get lost in the mess of data that we're going to go through, I want to make sure everyone is clear on the message I want to get across, and that is that not all surgical margins are the same. They're not all created equally. And we have to look at uh, different variables uh, to determine how to treat these different patients and uh, not lump them all into one, into one sum and determine uh, how they can best be managed by multimodal, multimodal therapies. So we'll start with uh, the first of three cases. So this is a 66-year-old male uh, who had um, Gleason 6 disease on a biopsy in 2006. He initially had active surveillance, um, but then decided, not from a biopsy, but decided to proceed with a, a radical prostatectomy. He ended up having uh, Gleason 3 plus 4 disease, T2C, and he had margins uh, at the uh, apex, and they were focal apical margins. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Skidder up to talk about uh, this patient's pathology. Um, so before I go, go on to discussing this particular case, uh, just because this is the apical margin, I just want to quickly show you how we um, evaluate the apex uh, for these cases. So first of all, we, we paint the exterior surface of the uh, prostatectomy specimen and then basically shave off the, um, the apex, uh, divide it into quadrants, and then each quadrant is sectioned um, parallel to the urethral axis, so we get sections like this, so we can see the ink um, at the edge of the tissue. And so we end up with sections like this. This is not uh, uh, this patient, uh, but here we have uh, the well-defined uh, 
ink at the margin. In this particular case, we have a, a small focus of carcinoma, so we can uh, easily see the relationship between the, the tumor and the margin. So if we go to uh, this particular case, here we have the ink at the margin. Over here is benign prostatic tissue, and this is all uh, carcinoma. And here on low power examination, you can see that the carcinoma is getting very close uh, to the edge of the tissue. <clears throat> and so on higher power, you can see just this very focal area in which tumor cells uh, are present at the inked resection margin. But if you move over here, although the tumor is very close to the margin, uh, it is separated by a very thin uh, rim of um, fibroblastic tissue. So if, if that's all we saw, we would have called that negative. So this is the, the area of positive margin. It measures only about one millimeter the other issue that we have at apical margins is whether there's extraprostatic uh, extension or not. And here you can see the tumor is present within very dense uh, fibromuscular stroma, suggesting that it is still within the prostatic uh, tissue. Um, this is a section uh, from the uh, anterior portion of the, of the mid-prostate. And in, in many areas of the prostate, the, the boundary between the the prostate gland and the extraprostatic tissue uh, is, is very obvious. And so if there's tumor <coughs> within the fat, it would be very easy to identify this as extraprostatic um, extension. The problem in the apex is that there's very little fat. Um, so here on this section, we have a little bit of fat here. There's a few fat cells there and then a few fat cells there. So where to draw the line at the edge of the prostate, I don't know if you do you draw it kind of linking the, the areas of the fat, or is this still part of the prostate? And so that makes it very difficult to evaluate um, whether the tumor has gone into extraprostatic tissue. And again, if, if you have tumor um, going into this area, it, it would easily obliterate the fat, and then you would really not be able to identify it, whether it's within the prostate or uh, outside of the prostate. Here, this is another section from the apex. This is all benign uh, uh, prostatic uh, tissue. Uh, and this section actually doesn't have any fat. Uh, some pathologists will, will say that um, the, the boundary is, is between the dense uh, fibromuscular stroma of the prostate and this loose connective tissue. Uh, but I think this is very uh, poorly reproducible. Um, so I mean, some, some pathologists would identify the edge of the prostate here. But again, the problem is if you have if you have cancer going into this loose connective tissue, you're going to get a fibroblastic response and you're really going to lose that uh, that boundary. So uh, using that criteria, it's very uh, poorly reproducible. Okay. Brian, where's the, where's the urethral mucosa? I mean, when you guys call it positive urethral margin, well, we don't really use that term positive urethral margin, or I mean, most of us don't. So we generally most are. Most of us have been around for a while and have seen that. Okay, so maybe that was before my time. Um, but <laughs> Previous generations. Last I mean, the, 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 so the, the urethra would kind of be along around here. Uh, but I think what happens is the urethra kind of re retracts. Um, so we often don't see um, urethelium in these sections. But really, what we're we're talking about is the apical um, margin, you know, all of, all of this tissue. So, in summary, this is a positive surgical margin. In yes. So, focal one millimeter uh, positive margin, and no evidence that it's into extraprostatic tissue at the at the margin. <clears throat> As touched, but not through the capsule. Well, we just say it's it's present at the inked <laughs> margin. So it's a little. I, I I don't I don't know if there's okay. tumor left behind or no, no, whether. I just wanted clearly to know how you read this. Yeah. Thank you. So as you can see, even with um, our first case, you know, it's, it's hard to to interpret these uh, to interpret these cases, um, and um, the variability between between uh, pathologists uh, is present and they've studied that uh, in depth that 
there is a, quite a bit of variability, uh, particularly between um, larger centers and, and community centers. So an important question, everyone, is does size matter? Um, and uh, with most answers, it depends on who you ask. And um, in this situation, there's a, Epstein wrote uh, a paper that looked at focal versus extensive margins. Uh, and when separating them in this respect, uh, there was a difference uh, between focal versus extensive margins, focal being one to two areas of extension. Um, some studies have been a bit more specific and looked at an actual millimeter length of the margin. Um, and a study by uh, Babian did show that in T2 patients, the extent of margin uh, was one of the only predictors of recurrence on uh, multiple regression analysis. But again, like most things in positive margins in prostate cancer, there's a lot of uh, disagreement. And the red dots uh, just uh, show the studies that um, did not show a significant impact um, on biochemical recurrence depending on uh, the extent of the margin. And the green dots were the, are the ones that did show a difference. And even in these studies that were significant, um, some people use one millimeter, some people use focal versus extensive, and some use three millimeters. So the extent of the margin, uh, we don't have a clear-cut answer on how much extent uh, is something we should worry about um, and or how little we can ignore. Uh, now the other question, since we're looking at focal apical margins, is does the location matter? And now the apex is the most common margin, um, we'll discuss later, occurring about 30% of our, uh, our margin patients. <coughs> Um, it has been shown in a number of studies to be uh, less uh, worrisome, uh, have a lower risk of biochemical recurrence than such as uh, posterior or posterior lateral margins. Um, but should all apical margins in themselves be interpreted the same? Should an anterior apical margin be interpreted the same as a lateral apical margin? Um, so we have to take this into consideration that even in terms of location, not just the apex uh, can, be, uh, can be thought of as, as a specific point. And this is again a summary of a number of studies that have looked uh, at location. As you can see here, uh, there's quite a variety uh, of significant and non-significant results uh, for location. And even the ones that are significant <coughs> disagree on the area in which is, uh, which is most significant for location. So again, uh, there's still a debate um, on apical margins and how significant they are and whether they, uh, they should be treated the same as other margins. And why is the apex unique? Um, some of the thoughts as to why the apex is so common uh, for positive margins is that there's probably more retraction that occurs during the surgery at the apex and more trauma that occurs. And this may lead to uh, increasing the cancer cells when they really aren't uh, a positive margin being a falsely positive margin. And on the counterpoint, why might apical margins uh, not be significant? And some think that perhaps there's less vascular supply to the apex and so tumor left behind uh, is not going to uh, produce a recurrence. Now, management of, of this case I'm going to discuss after the next case um, as they sort of go together as they're both uh, T2 tumors. So I'm going to move on to case two, and after that we'll discuss uh, management of both those cases together. Uh, so case two is a capsular incision or a T2 positive margin. Uh, this is a 69-year-old patient uh, who underwent a robotic, robotic prostatectomy in 2009 for Gleason 7 disease, um, and he had microscopic uh, tumor present at the posterior ink margin uh, and the bladder neck uh, that suggested a capsular incision as opposed to an extra prostatic uh, extension. Uh, so capsular incision um, is difficult because where does it fit in? There's patients who are organ confined, T2 patients with negative margins who we consider to be cured, and then there's those patients who have extra ca capsular extension with positive margins that we feel are at higher risk. So where does an incision into the prostate fit into this uh, uh, spectrum of patients? Um, and if those patients are at risk, what is the risk of biochemical recurrence? And then furthermore, what is the risk of local recurrence in those patients? And how does the pathologist define uh, a capsular incision and how do they interpret these? So again, we'll pass on to Dr. Skinner to look at this patient's pathology. So this is the uh, bladder neck uh, margin uh, from this patient, and it, it would be processed uh, the same way as we do uh, with the apical margin. Uh, so here we have the ink at the edge of the tissue, and this is all tumor here, uh, and you see this uh, dark area here on low power uh, right at the inked margin. So here you can see this is a small nerve with tumor uh, 
uh, wrapped around. It's a bit cauterized, so you don't see the, the actual uh, you know, cells of the tumor, but this is at uh, an inked um, cauterized margin, uh, and this focus would be less than one millimeter uh, here. So the question at the bladder neck uh, is whether this is uh, still within the prostatic gland or whether it's into the actual bladder neck tissue. Uh, so the bladder neck tissue uh, shows uh, very um, uh, well-defined bundles of smooth muscle, uh, which we do not see here. And also within the, the same slide, there were uh, areas of benign prostatic tissue so this would indicate that this is still within the prostate gland and not invading into the bladder neck. Is that invading the sheath or a uh, lymphatic space around the nerve? It looks like it's kind of symmetrical around the nerve. What is that? Yeah, it's just it just invades the the perineural sheath. It's, uh, in not, the it's, sheath? it's not uh, lymphatics. It's getting my workout up and down today. Um, so again, let's talk about the significance of these uh, T2 positive margins or capsular incisions. Uh, and again, there's debate as to whether they're significant or not. Um, I'll just show you a few papers that have shown uh, different opinions on this. Uh, this paper has shown that a capsular incision, um, whether it's a benign glands or tumor, uh, really does not make a difference. Uh, and um, that, uh, that these capsular incisions um, are, are not significant in this situation in terms of uh, a biochemical recurrence. Whereas this paper here is a bit more uh, equivocal. Uh, it's showing that uh, here in the first arrow, this is a capsular incision here. Um, and then the second arrow, this is a focal extraprostatic uh, <coughs> extension with positive margins. And here you can see this is extensive. So a capsular incision in this paper fits somewhere in between focal and extensive extraprostatic margins, so it's, it's somewhat significant. Whereas in this paper here, they've shown that uh, the dark line is a T2 margin, and the gray line is a, a T3 margin, and they, they both have a similarly uh, poor uh, progression-free survival, so this one was significant. So again, we're, we are stuck with um, uh, data that shows whether these T2 margins uh, are significant or not, and there's quite a bit of variability uh, in the research out there. So just back to our, our cases, uh, to remind you the first case was a focal apical margin uh, with, it, it appeared to be non-extension uh, outside the prostate, however it is difficult to uh, determine. And the second case is a T2 positive margin. So the question is how should we manage these patients and should they be managed with adjuvant radiation uh, or should they be observed and have possible salvage radiation? And that's where the controversy uh, arises. Um, approximately 30% of these patients uh, will be at risk of biochemical recurrence, and another 70% uh, may not be at risk. Um, and we don't have any head-to-head -head trials comparing uh, adjuvant versus salvage radiation uh, therapy. However, we do have a number of uh, large phase three trials that uh, looked at adjuvant therapy and comparing that to observations, so we'll be focusing on those tri trials. However, we do have uh, a trial from uh, Dr. Sullivan uh, that did talk about uh, the use of radiation therapy for high-risk disease. Um, and uh, compared uh, the use of adjuvant versus salvage radiation therapy uh, and did find that uh, early radiation uh, did improve local control but didn't have an impact on overall survival. So we do have uh, some data here from UBC on this. Uh, so now I'll pass it over to Dr. Tilsey to discuss the uh, radiation point of view uh, on this. Thank you. Before Thanks. Scott starts, do you want to ask a couple of folks in the audience how they would manage this? Uh, yes, I think we have time uh, before we give our opinion on this. Does anyone, how would you manage that? So the, the second case is interesting because it was robotic and mm -hmm. it's at the base. I don't know what Larry would say to this, but I always feel, you know, we're always grabbing the base and yanking the prostate to the right and to the left and like either with robotic arm or assistant arm and invariably it tears off and we take a little chunk that comes off. Some resin stabbing it, it repeatedly. So I wonder specifically in robotic whether there's you know the more trauma to the prostate that increases the risk of a positive margin yeah. at the base. Particularly those areas similar yeah. to, a, to an apex. Yes, that's the, that's the robotics the are gentle 
<laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. We're gentle. 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 we are gentle 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 we are why we see it's just differences in all mm -hmm. these different studies. So I think it comes down to the definition of mm -hmm. margins. Even pathologists, and there was a study from, I think it was out of Toronto, that the pathologist down at Prince's Market, uh, the Dutch side of that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Andrew Evans? Evans, yeah, that was. No, there was a, a Dutch pathologist. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and he did inter and intra variability mm -hmm. and found pretty significant differences. <coughs> Even nice. intra observer variability, and then we, I forget what the numbers were, there was something like 70% of these. Uh, so, yeah. so, up to 0.8 in the Kappa value, uh, yeah. so uh, inter-observer But if you think that 20% which is pretty very, good. It's good, but it, then again may explain why we see differences in different studies, depending on the pathologist. Yeah. Also, this there case selection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many people would radiate either one of those two cases. Would anybody send them for radiation? I do. I do have a slide on that as well on the interview variability. I'd like to make a technical point. The dissection of the apex is vital because that's continents and the nerves and everything down there. And it has to be extremely precise and extremely, and you can only do so much. But the bladder neck. Why not sacrifice routinely a half a centimeter to a centimeter of bladder neck? Dr. Tanago's base plate is this big. It's not going to interfere with continence, and you can throw a chunk of bladder neck away, and nobody knows, and it will cut down on your positive margin rate. Just a technical point. You don't have to skin it that thin. Yeah, that's a point. Okay, I mean, I guess <clears throat> I'm not sure I would have irradiated either of those guys, but it would be nice to see them to discuss it at least and. I mean, I guess my take on point would be I don't I don't think we should radiate everybody with positive margins, but I do think we should think about it in everybody with positive margins. And uh, if you don't radiate them with positive margins, make sure you're watching them closely for early biochemical salvage or early uh, salvage at time of. Uh, you just press the it's the computer. That's just a uh, laser pointer. Oh, okay. got it. Okay. Sorry, I'm uh, showed up at the wrong room. I was on time, but I was at the wrong the wrong place. It's right there. Yeah, right there. There we go. Okay, so this is actually a summary slide of the of the adjuvant trials that uh, Michelle's slide. I used her slide because it was better than my slide, but basically it shows the three the three randomized trials showing that all three of them consistently show a reduction in biochemical uh, recurrence in terms of overall survival and disease uh, and metastasis free survival. There's a bit of discrepancy in that the SWOG study showed about a ten percent metastasis survival benefit at 12 years where the URTC trial, which was larger but at shorter follow-up, hadn't shown the benefit, at least not yet, at 10 years. Um, the point I want to make here from the, from the URTC trial is looking at apical margins. It's one of the cases was about apical margins. And I guess there's two points on this slide. This is a forest plot showing a breakdown of the, uh, of the different uh, margin locations. And there was apical only margin positive. And the first thing to say, I guess, is that there weren't many apical only, which is a bit surprising given that that's a fairly common type of positive margin. So there's obviously some case selection going into the study. The other thing to say is that the hazard rate, at least the risk reduction, overall looks sort of fairly similar to the other margins, although the confidence intervals are close to the, to the, uh, 
threshold for significance. So I don't think it really answers the questions. But looking at that, you'd say, well, it doesn't seem to make a big difference what type of margin you have with those caveats. And this is just the survival curve that uh, wasn't on the last slide from the SWOG study showing that that 10-year, 12-year metastasis-free survival benefit did seem to translate into a statistically significant overall, overall survival benefit, albeit with you know, relatively small numbers out there in 12 years. Whereas the, uh, the EORTC <coughs> trial at 10 years, this is death from prostate cancer, were in both arms quite small thus far. So it, it, it doesn't make a, a big difference in terms of survival, I think it's safe to say, out to 10 years. And somebody who's got a life expectancy beyond 10 years, it might. If we look at patients with uh, uh, T2 disease with surgical margin positive or uh, uh, pathologically positive margins from the EORTC data, this is again a forest plot showing that subgroup with um, extra capsular extension negative here, uh, margin positive, showing again the, the risk reduction, at least the hazard ratio, is similar to the surgical margin positive extra capsular extension. So at least in this paper, it looked like it was, it was of similar uh, uh, prognostic importance. <clears throat> One of the other things that's in common between these trials is that at least on the review of the, the uh, reviewed cases, so they did path review on the URTC cases in about a half of the cases, so that's why the the N drops to 500 from 1,000. And on the review, it looked like all of the benefit was restricted to the surgical margin positive patients. The surgical margin negative patients didn't have a benefit. So those would be the ones, again, the eligibility for that trial, you could have got into it with extra capsule extension without positive surgical margins, seminal vesicle involvement without positive margins, or they had positive margins. But it sort of implies that if they have seminal vesicle involvement, or extra capsule extension without positive margins, they didn't have a benefit to adjuvant radiation. Now that wasn't seen in the overall analysis, just in the path review and the cases that had undetectable PSA. So um, subgroup analysis, hypothesis generating, that certainly fits with what one would expect. Now the German trial showed a similar effect when they looked at added by margin status, showing that again, the, the benefit was isolated to the positive, positive margin patients. In terms of morbidity for management radiotherapy, I guess, you know, there's two perspectives on this. You can look at the data and say, well, there is morbidity, which clearly there is some morbidity. Or you can look at it and say the severe morbidity is quite low. Sorry, the figures, uh, some of the numbers have shifted in the columns here. But if we look at the EORTC trial in terms of grade 3 toxicity, um, it wasn't statistically significant, but probably meaningly different. This is the grade 3 toxicity in the watchful waiting arm was 2.6%. So that's after radical prostatectomy alone with some only about... 25% of patients got eventual salvage radiation versus 4.2% uh, in the adjuvant group. So significant morbidity is quite rare and similar in the SWOG study, particularly if you look at incontinence, the risk of incontinence attributable to the adjuvant radiation was only about 2%. Uh, in terms of stricture formation, it was about 7%. And similar data from the German trial, about a 4% uh, significant morbidity rate. Now the other, the other option, of course, is salvage radiation. And just a couple points to make there. If you look at the totality of the retrospective data, there's a variety of indicators that come out as being fairly consistent in predicting who's going to do best with salvage treatment. And those are ones who have a low PSA. Now, usually the way these studies are done is they split their cases from a retrospective series around the median, which is typically around one or two. And so patients who have a PSA of less than one at the time of salvage radiation do better than those who have a PSA of greater than one which isn't to say we want to wait till the PSA is 1, but that's just the way the data was analyzed in those studies. Patients who have seminal vesic involvement and have a biochemical recurrence tend to have a higher risk of systemic recurrence and therefore benefit less from adjuvant radiation or salvage radiation. Those who have a positive margin, although generally that's a bad thing, if you have a biochemical recurrence and have a positive margin, you're more likely to benefit from salvage treatment. If you have a low-grade disease or if you have a slow doubling time, those are fairly consistent indicators of benefit. The other point to make for salvage, this is from the Friedland paper, looking at if you take various different PSA cut points and look at how likely a patient is to continue to have a rising PSA if you keep watching them. Um, once you get above 0 0.1, it's about a 95% chance they're going to continue to rise in a way that would reflect a true biochemical recurrence. So the, the notion that it's somehow periurethral gland PSA production once your PSA gets above 0.1 one, while still possible, is very unlikely, and, and even less likely once it gets above 0.2. Now, obviously, there's some, there's some fuzzy in this in these numbers, but generally speaking, that number of around 0.2 is, is one where I think 
you know, really that's quite clearly the time when we'd want to be seeing them for early salvage, or even when it's 0 0.1, we should be thinking about it. Um, happy to see them when it's detectable even to discuss it and, and start thinking about what, what we want to do. Um, but there's, there are some cases where people uh, have a, a mildly elevated but very low PSA, an ultra-sensitive PSA, who never have a true recurrence. That does happen. Is early salvage as good as, as adjuvant? There's retrospective data on that, no randomized data, as Michelle says, but, um, you know, it's conflicting data. We just pulled out two that show some conflict. This is uh, from MD Anderson showing that if, you, if you're if you selective about uh, who you compare, for patients who have positive margins that have a very low PSA at the time of salvage radiation, their biochemical disease-free survival is similar to as if you gave the whole group adjuvant radiation. Um, this is from a pooled uh, institutional analysis where they matched pre treatment factors or you know, post-surgical factors, but not, uh, not their factors at the time of salvage. So PSA grade, seminal vesicle involvement, margins, and duration of follow-up, and did a matched pair analysis for those who had adjuvant versus salvage treatment and showed that it, it looked like the adjuvant patients have a better biochemical disease-free survival. So I think we just don't know for certain whether early salvage is as good as adjuvant. And that's why this randomized trial is ongoing amongst others, and this is open across the province, as many as you know, that has a couple of randomizations, so it's a busy slide, but the key randomization here for, for our purposes for the adjuvant patients is that there's a group where you can randomize into immediate radiation or deferred radiation, in other words, uh, observation with, with a view to deferred radiotherapy should they have a biochemical recurrence. There's some other randomizations with respect to hormone therapy, but that's the one that's looking at is early salvage as good as adjuvant to hopefully answer that question for once in a while that for once and for all that aspect of this trial is not accruing that quickly but they've got several hundred patients internationally into that arm already in terms of bc data this is bc data from the pathology registry so looked at all the incident cases of about nine thousand for these three years so about three a little over three thousand cases a year in the registry and this is just in terms of their primary treatment within a year of diagnosis. So about a quarter of them had radical prostatectomy. And of those, we looked at the pathology reports on them. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily uh, Brian Skinner or, or Ed Jones pathology. It's across the whole province. We don't necessarily have the level of detail that's in, you know, um, uh, large uh, centers of excellence as detailed pathology reports necessarily. Um, but some of the factors we can say, and you know, pretty consistently report on whether the margins are positive, and about, about a third of patients had positive margins, and of those, about 30% were apical only. If you look at the other risk factors that would have got people into the randomized trials, about 47% had at least one of those risk factors. In terms of how that compares to what people think ought to be our positive margins rate, this is from that CCO um, series, uh, suggesting that based on sort of polling the uh, urologist in Ontario, yeah, you should probably have a positive margin rate of around 25% or less if you have PT2 disease. And if we look specifically at the ones who had PT2 disease in BC, it was about 30%. So I mean, those numbers aren't too different. I mean, I guess it's always nice to have them a little bit lower, but I don't know that it's, it's hugely off. Um, and then, of course, higher if they had T3 disease. Now, if we look again at what happened to those patients in terms of how many got adjuvant radiation, at least between 2005 and 2007, of those uh, half of the patients that had high risk factors, about a quarter had eventual salvage radiation within a couple of years of diagnosis. Now, one would expect that more might as time goes on, and only 2% had early uh, adjuvant therapy defined by somebody who had radiation within six months of their surgery and an undetectable PSA. Now, if we look at the patients with positive margins specifically, about 36% of them eventually got radiation, now mostly for salvage radiation. And only about a quarter of them at that time were seen within six months of surgery. And of those quarter, most were seen within six months because they had a rising PSA. So not for ad adjuvant therapy, but for salvage therapy. Of those quarter, only 9%, so 10% of the quarter, had adjuvant radiation. Of the ones who didn't have any radiation, looking at those cases, about two-thirds of those ones who didn't were eligible for adjuvant, meaning they had an undetectable PSA and were referred for adjuvant therapy. But, you know, in terms of looking at the radiation oncologist opinion, opinions were split. About 40% of those, the, the, the oncologist consult opinion said you shouldn't have radiation treatment, presumably because they had focal positive margins and reasons not to think about it. And the other half were offered radiation or observation, and, and a small group of them elected adjuvant radiation. Now, this predates the SWOG survival data. It was at the time when we had biochemical disease-free survival data alone. <coughs> 
If we look back at did a similar study, we're just sort of working on the details of this is a very preliminary analysis, um, and I haven't shown this really to anywhere sort of significant here. Um, 99 to 2,000 diagnosis cases. If we just look at the patients who had positive margins with the extra capsular extensions, there weren't that many of the of those two years. What happened to them over the next 10 years? And you know, we don't know in terms of their biochemical control, but the things we are able to tell at a provincial level is whether they died of prostate cancer, whether they started on hormone therapy, or whether they had salvage radiation. And if you look at those as endpoints, about half of them eventually have that. Of the other half, about 20% had had adjuvant radiation or hormones. 4% had had an orchiectomy that I didn't capture in that initial hormone therapy assessment. 15% had died of other causes. So it left about 30% of those who were alive and event-free. Um, i hand it back to Michelle. Okay. In the interest of time, we'll keep moving, and then we can have more questions at the end for Dr. Tilsley. So just to come back to our cases, so um, both the first case uh, who had vocal margins and the second case who had the capsular incision, they both did not uh, have radiation, and uh, they were both alive and well without any recurrence at this point in time. Um, so as we sort of discussed, you know, these cases are very focal, very small positive margins, uh, and perhaps if they were larger margins, a larger T2 margin or T3 margin, uh, they may have gone for radiation, but as you can see, uh, only, only about 2% of those are actually going for radiation. Um, so this is a slide adapted from uh, Dr. Gleeve. Sort of as a counterpoint, if we, if we take 100 patients, 100 hypothetical <laughs> patients, um, and based on the SWOG data, if we take those 100 patients and we give them all adjuvant radiation, 30% um, of those will benefit from that. Now, if we take those same 100 patients and we don't give them adjuvant radiation, but we follow them, uh, about 60% or so will require early salvage therapy. Of those, about half uh, will benefit from that. So if we take these numbers that are extrapolated from the SWOG data, you are radiating about 100 patients in order to uh, prevent 28 failures. Um, so, you know, if, if there's a certain percentage of 28% or 28 patients are destined to fail anyway, uh, perhaps um, in some situations with the right selected patients, perhaps salvage therapy uh, in this situation um, uh, may be beneficial. Another way of looking at this is from another paper, um, just sort of highlighted here, if you look um, down uh, the right half of the graph, you can see that patients who have a, a lower Gleason score, who have uh, a, a lower pre-radiation PSA, uh, who have positive margins and the doubling times of, uh, the longer doubling times are better, they have quite a good response. These are patients who had salvage therapy. Have a good response to salvage therapy with a good four-year uh, disease-free survival rate. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, red circles here, these are the patients who had a higher Gleason score, had a higher pre-radiation PSA, had negative margins, and these patients don't do as well. So we have to be able to separate these patients out. We have to be able to risk stratify them to see what patients are going to benefit from salvage and which patients we should be uh, giving adjuvant therapy to. Uh, so the, I think the, one of the big take-home messages from this is that we, we need to be able to better risk stratify our patients uh, so that we're not over-treating patients. Uh, at the same time, we're not under-treating patients that uh, can benefit from radiation. So uh, move on quickly to the last case. Um, this is a, a case of a patient with a positive lymph node and positive margins. So a 74-year-old gentleman. Uh, who had uh, a recent surgery in, in April of 2011, who had um, clinical T3 disease, PSA uh, of 26. Um, they ended up with a Gleason 9 disease with positive lymph nodes and a positive surgical margin at the apex. So let's uh, look at uh, the pathology from these, uh, from these slides. So um, this is a section from the left posterior uh, area of the prostate. And this, this is the, the, the prostate gland here, and you can see here's uh, adipose tissue um, indicating extra prostatic uh, tissue, and here you have tumor uh, extensively going into extra prostatic uh, tissue. In this area of extra prostatic extension, um, the margin you can see out here uh, was negative. So uh, the, the tumor that was extra prostatic um, is not at the margin. Um, also, just to mention that this is the uh, pelvic lymph node, so here you have a small area of residual lymph node 
uh, with extensive involvement by uh, adenocarcinoma. But here, if we, if we look at the apical margin, again, you can see the, uh, the ink at the edge. And actually, all of this in the, in the tissue is, is cancer. And up at the top, you can see it getting very close to the margin. And again, um, the, the tumor gets a little bit crushed, so the cells are a bit small. But I mean, this is tumor at the, uh, at the ink. Um, this was over a distance of about two millimeters. And there's no evidence that this is extraprostatic in this location. It is still within this dense uh, fibromuscular stroma, indicating that it's still within the prostate uh, tissue. Okay, so uh, this patient, as you can see, has extracapsular extension, uh, but also has a margin in an area of non-extracapsular extension, and has a positive lymph node. Um, so what, uh, what will people do in, in this situation? Um, perhaps you can ask um, someone, maybe not for BGH, Dr. Taylor, do you, what do you, would you think in this, of a, of a positive lymph node, uh, positive margins, um, how would you manage uh, this patient with high-risk disease? Small therapy, okay. Which I think is, um, uh, is, is the, sort of the, is quite common. Um, you know, lymph node invasion was thought to be uh, a marker of non-curable systemic disease. However, more recent studies have shown that people do get uh, fairly good um, five, ten year outcomes, uh, even with uh, lymph node invasion, um, particularly in the low volume uh, patients. So historically, these patients were managed by adjuvant therapy, adjuvant um, uh, hormone therapy, and you can see here from the Messing uh, trial that uh, immediate adjunct deprivation therapy did have uh, improved um, uh, survival advantage over observation. However, as you can see here in this summary of a number of uh, papers, looking at the cancer-specific five, well, at five and ten years, these are all patients who had a radical prostatectomy, a pelvic lymph node dissection, and positive nodes. Uh, these patients actually do uh, fairly well out to five to ten years, so perhaps we should be doing perhaps more than just adjuvant therapy, uh, which sort of just delays progression. Um, and we don't have any um, uh, retrospective uh, trials on this or RTCs on this, but we do have a prospective uh, case match uh, trial here that looks at the use of uh, hormone therapy in, con in conjunction with radiation therapy versus hormone <coughs> therapy alone. Um, and this trial did show that the use of hormone therapy and radiation improved both cancer-specific survival as well as overall survival in these patients. Um, and so um, I think in, in this situation, uh, perhaps uh, we should be a bit more aggressive with our lymph node positive patients uh, and offering them uh, both uh, radiation and, horm and hormone therapy to improve their overall survival. Um, so just to go over some of the take-home points, um, I think it's impor important, like um, Dr. Sullivan said, that uh, functional outcomes are important but we need to focus on good operative technique and try to minimize our, our margin rates as best as possible as they are significant um, and a number of studies have shown that. We have to remember not all margins are created equally uh, and we need to do a better job in risk stratifying our patients to determine who will do best with adjuvant therapy and who we can follow. Um, and I think it's clear from the large phase three trials that adjuvant therapy is superior to observation, uh, particularly in high risk disease. Um, but uh, hopefully with uh, further trials, we'll find out more about the use of salvage therapy and how that can be implemented uh, early uh, in patients. Uh, and lastly, uh, node-positive patients, I think, can, can do well with radiation therapy. Uh, I think we should be offering that to our patients. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, Dr. Skinner for uh, talking, as well as Dr. Tilsley and Dr. Glee for his support.